Okay, well, um, thank you everybody. It's my pleasure to um, open the uh, PhD defense of uh, Moira Febe Huet. So I hope I pronounced it correctly. We haven't met yet, I have to say. Uh, so this thesis it is um, a test de doctorat de l'Université de Lyon uh, qui a été réalisé à l'INSA dans l'école doctorale 162 et comme spécialité acoustique. Uh, so the title of the thesis is uh, Voice Mixology at the Cocktail Party, Combining Behavioral and Neural Tracking for Speech Segregation. Uh, the committee will be, um, so in order of um, uh, the questions, will be um, composed of uh, Fanny Meunier, who is Directrice de Recherche à l'Université Côté de... Uh, well, <laughs> all right, that's what's written on the thesis. I'm learning things. Um, uh, Caroline McGettigan, who's a professor at University College London. Um, Etienne Gaudrin, who is chargé de recherche au CRNL à Lyon. And Etienne Parizet, who is a professor at the uh, INSA Lyon. And myself, I'm Daniel Presnitzer, and uh, I will also serve as the president of this committee. So, Moira Febe, you have uh, about 45 minutes to uh, present your work, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on to the questions. The floor is yours. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, before starting, I would like to thank all the committee members who agreed to be here, um, physically or virtually, uh, to evaluate my work. Uh, furthermore, I would like to welcome the public who came despite the COVID situation. I am so happy to be here with you to present my thesis work. Um, so, um, being able to follow a conversation in noise is perhaps one of the most important functions of our sense of hearing. This challenge, usually described as the cocktail party effect, has been studied for more than 65 years and still nowadays we don't exactly know how the auditory system parses this complex scene. Answering this question is crucial as it is a situation which, which can lead to real life issues such as a poor communication during a Skype meeting or during a PhD defense. Um, first, I would like to briefly focus on the literature about the cocktail party effect. Usually, the, party, the cocktail party effect is studied through the simple situation where only two speakers are competing. And how listeners select a target speaker here in green, while at the same time they're ignoring another voice, also called the mask speak stream here in, in red, is the central question of those studies. Two main approaches seek to understand this phenomenon in literature. The first one, a more traditional behavioral approach, studies the perceptive and cognitive treatments involved in the cocktail party effect. As such, they usually use simple stimuli such as tones, syllables, words, or sometimes sentences. More recently, a second research field has emerged, usually called the neural tracking or sometimes the speech tracking. The main, the, main, sorry, the main goal of this approach is to obtain the best neural representation of the speaker. This, this study usually requires a lot of data and use very long stimuli such as one minute trial. The neural tracking approach comes with the assumption that participants' attention remains focused on the target speaker without any attentional switch. However, this is never controlled and from our own personal experience and literature, we know that it can be sometimes difficult. On the other hand, the attentional focus is controlled in the behavior approach due to the small duration of the stimuli. But this, is, this also comes with a cost. Um, I don't know why. Okay. So um, the behavioral approach also comes with a, with a cost. Because the stimuli are so short, uh, they are not similar to real life speech material and as such, they have a limited cognitive processes involvement, such as the working memory or the semantic uh, cue. Um, on, the other, on the other end, um, the impact of, um, I'm sorry, I have a few messed up with, with the remote. Um, on the other end, the impact of these cognitive treatments, so such the working memory and the semantic cue, are part of the neural tracking because they use very long stimuli and 
therefore they look more like real life communication material. In conclusion, these two approaches study the same phenomenon but with different stimuli and hence different limitations. To address this limitation, we designed a new concurrent speech task with two goals in mind. First, to document the performance of the participants and two, to bridge the gap between the two approaches, so the neural tracking and the behavioral approach. Um, first of all, I would like to present the final version of this new concurrent speech task. And before talking about the stimuli, I would like to give you an idea how it sounds like. So here is a, an example of a trial. And what is going to happen is that you're going to hear two speakers talking simultaneously. And this instruction for you is to carefully listen to the people, to the speaker who said, who start with the word attention. Um, here, a quick note, I'm sorry for the English speakers, but all my materials is in French, so you might not be able to do the trial as good as the French native speakers, so I'm very sorry. Um, so you're going to hear two people talking at the same time. Your task for you is to listen to the speaker who said the word attention, and you need to carefully listen to that person because at the end of the trial, nine words were, would, uh, are going to appear in front of you, and your task is to select the word who belonged to the target you were meant to, to listen. Okay, um, let's go. Are you ready? Okay. Attention, l'odorat est l'un de nos sens les plus fondamentaux. Ce trouble fonctionnel intestinal existe aussi sous une forme sévère congénitale. Les impressions infractives ne sont pas contrôlées sur le chemin qui conduit à notre conscience. Okay. Um, here are... Here, is the, here are the, the nine words, and I don't know if you have an idea of which words belong to the target story, so the, the word, the, sorry, the voice you were meant to listen to. I'll give you a few seconds. Yeah. And so the answer is the word fundamental, vu and chemin. Let me explain. Here you have the two stories you were listening to. In blue, you have the target story, so the story you were meant, meant to listen to that. And here you have the three words, fundamental, vu, in the, in, the, in the middle, and chemin at the end. Here in orange, you have the masker uh, stories. And as you can see, there are three words in purples. These three words belong to the masker stories. So we have three words from the target, three words from the masker. And uh, you can see there is also three uh, words in white. Those three words uh, from now on, I'm going to call them the extra news keywords because because they do not belong to neither stories. What are the key points of this new concurrent task, speech task? First, we're going to use them with a long with long stimuli. Two, this is a selective word recognition discrimination test, hence the long sword test. And one uh, important benefit of our task is it allows us to infer intentional switch for three points in time. Um, I don't know if you have noticed, but the three words are reported in the beginning of the stories, in the middle of the stories, and at the end of the story. As such, we have information regarding the story you were listening at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the stories. A few words about the stimuli and the design. All the stories come from the same audiobook, well, the French audiobook Guts. Uh, all the story were selected according to criteria. First, uh, the meaning. They had to be important. They had to be fun fact or an anecdote. The main, the main thing is that we wanted uh, the participants' concentration to be uh, as its best. And also we selected only story that lasts between 11 to 18 seconds. Then once we had selected all the story, what we did is that we matched two stories together. So a story that was meant to be a target and there's a story that was meant to be the masker. So this pair was always locked together. To do this matching, we used two criteria. First, of course, the duration. And the second criteria was that if a keyword belong in the story, then um, this, keyword, this keyword was not allowed to appear in the target story. So that was an exclusion criteria of matching. 
Regarding the keywords themselves, as I said, we had three, we had the main uh, inclusion criteria, one, one keyword at the beginning, one keyword in the middle, and one at the end, but we also used two exclusion. First, we never used the very first and the very last words of the stories. As such, we wanted to be sure that we were going to minimize the primacy and the recent effect. Second, uh, we never selected a word that were repeated more than once in the stories. Finally, we also took care that all the words selected were not too frequent or too rare in the language. And to do so, we used a French database called Lexic to compare all the frequency of our keyword set with all the words, the French words in the language. Finally, regarding the final design, we have 12 blocks of, if you want, 12 lists of stories. Within each block, there is 12 pairs of stories, so 12 pairs of a Margaret and a Masker stories. And each block lasts pretty much three minutes. So because there's three, three blocks with three, uh, sorry, 12 blocks with, with 12 stories in it, there is at the end 144 trial for the long sword test at the, in the final. With this new task in mind, uh, we wanted to perform to document the performance of the participant with this new task compared to the behavioral approach because now we were using long stimuli. From literature, we knew that there are three main cues that help to segregate two speakers. The first two cues are quite uh, automatic and uh, they regard the specialization of the speakers and also the vocal characters characteristic be uh, difference between the two speakers. For instance, uh, male and female uh, speakers are easier to distinguish than two female. Um, the third cue is a more top-down process is related to our linguistic knowledge uh, of the speaker. With this in mind, so we conducted the first experiment with 22 participants. And what we did is that we used the first two um, speaker segregation cue to manipulate the difficulty of our task. Hence, as I remember, there is 12 blocks in the long sword test, so half of the blocks were played dutifully. It means that the two speakers were played simultaneously in the two years, and the other six blocks of the long sword test were played dichotically. It means that one speaker was played in, in one year while the other one was played in the left year. We also use the vocal characteristics uh, as a um, level of difficulty. And here is a, a trick. How can you tell that two people sounds different? How can you tell that two, two vo vo uh, voice sounds different? This is why, because it's difficult to evaluate, uh, we decided to create the mask voice from the target voice. To do so, we manipulated two parameters of the voice the fundamental frequency and the vocal track length. The vocal, uh, the fundamental frequency is usually associated to the pitch of the voice, while the vocal track length of the voice is, us is usually associated to the size of the speaker. Um, I'm going to give you an example now of the voice so you have a more uh, inside idea of how it sounds like. So here you have on this figure, you have the difference in semitones in the vocal track length for the voice. Here you have on the Y axis, the difference in speech. And here you have the target voice. From the literature, we knew that the shift of eight semitones in the, from the, in the pitch would help us to create a male uh, voice. The original voice is a female voice. So what we did is that we compute a difference of eight semitones um, to create the, the male voice. So here is, is, here is how sounds the female voice. Attention. And here is how the male voice sounds like after we manipulated it. À Francfort, en Allemagne, on voit régulièrement des fils d'ados faire la queue devant le magasin sombre au parfum envoûtant. So here we had an easy condition. So we decided to create a difficult condition. What we did is that from the literature, we knew that there is um, a distance of 1.71 semitones between the two voice, uh, two voice will be what is called a just noticeable difference. It means that the two voice 
can barely be uh, been di distinguished. So uh, one more time, this is how sounds the target voice, attention, and this is how sounds the just noticeable difference. C'est aussi sur cet effet que misent certains magasins qui pratiquent le marketing olfactif. I don't know if you were able to, to hear the difference. Um, finally, because we had an, an easy condition and a difficult uh, condition, we decided to create an intermediate condition. Uh, till this day, I still cannot uh, say if it's a female or male voice. Uh, let's hear it. Une marque de vêtements américaine utilise même des phéromones sexuels. So, with this uh, different level of difficulty, uh, we ran the experiment, but before going to the results, I would like to uh, briefly uh, talk about the semantic. As I said, there are three cues that can, that, can be help, that can help to segregate two speakers. We already used the first two to manipulate the difficulty. So what we wanted to do here was to control how a semantic cue can, be, uh, can help the target to segregate, uh, this, uh, participant to segregate two speakers. This is how we constructed our measure of the semantic context. Here you have the same example as earlier. So you have here in blue the target voice uh, with the keywords in green. You have the mask voice with the keywords in purple. And what we did is we average the semantic distance between the keywords here, fundamental, with all the other words of the target. As such, by averaging all this semantic distance, we were able to compute the, similarity, the semantic similarity between the target keywords and all the target context. We did the same with the mask keyword. So we computed the, we calculated the semantic difference between the word trouble and all the other words from the target stories. And as such, we have the, similar, the semantic similarity between the mask keywords and the target uh, context. Finally, with these two measures in mind, we can uh, we can calculate the probability that the target keyword is semantically closer to the target story than the mask keyword. It means that if we have a higher probability that the target keyword is semantically closer to the target story, if participants rely on a semantic context to answer to the length of the test, it means that uh, if the target keyword is closer, even if they're not hearing the word fundamental or they were not able, but they rely on the general idea of the semantic context of the target, then when they're in front of the three by three entering matrix, they can be helped by the semantic cube. So with all these methods in mind, let's go to the results. So here is um, the percentage correct for each condition. Here you have on the Y the, the percentage. Here you have on the X axis, you have the distance between the two voice. So it means that here is difficult condition because there are small distances, distance between the two voice and here you have the easy condition. All the yellow box is the dyotic presentation. So the two, here, the two stories and the two here's, while the purple is the dichotic. So one story in one here. What, what is striking is that we have five main condition where, well, we have huge selling, selling effects. Um, actually, what really happened is that we have only one condition where participants make errors. And this is the difficult condition with the dietic presentation. Um, here, in, with, with the dashed line, you have the change. So it means that people, the participants are making error, but somehow they still manage to do the test. Um, what is really important is to understand where do the error come from? Are they making error because they're distracted or because they're selecting the masker error, thinking uh, it was the masker stories? So, of course, what is really important is the condition where participants were making error, so this one. And what we can uh, observe is that we have the main difference uh, for the ratio between the extraneous keywords, so it means that for the green Participants selected the extraneous keywords, the words that belong to neither stories, while in blue, they selected the mask keywords. Finally, um, we also looked at the, the impact of the semantic effect. Um, here you have, we, we ran a GLMM, and here you have the um, X 
axis, you have the semantic context. So if the, the higher the semantic context is, the higher the target is close to the target, uh, the target keyword is close to the target um, context. Here you have the probability of a correct answer. And what you can see is that not in the easy condition, but in the other two, the more the target is keen to be associated to the target context, the more the, the probability of the correct answers is but it's not the case for the easy condition. What are the conclusions of this first experiment? First, uh, we observe, like in literature, a main dichotic advantage and also a distance between the two voice advantage. Regarding the semantic, we observe also a benefit, but not if the conditions are too easy. The hypothesis here is that the vocal characteristics between the two speakers are already enough to discriminate the two speakers, and hence participants don't need to rely on additional semantic cue. Finally, we have one main condition where there is error, mainly due to the masker selection. That's why we decided to run a second experiment to understand what's happened around this particular condition. So the dietic was a very small difference. Um, the, second, the second experiment we ran, uh, 30 participants took it. We only used a dietic presentation because the dichotic was, a, we, we thought it was a, main, a major selling effect. And this time we used six voice distance. Uh, here you have, compared to the previous figure, you have a zoom here. So you have uh, here the two voice from the previous experiment. And in, with the triangle, you have all the voice this time we selected. As you can see, we, one more time, we took the same condition to see if we can replicate the results. Um, regarding the results, we have a major voice effect. The more the two speakers are, the, the bigger the distance between the two voice um, is high, the more the participant, the easier it gets for the participant and this and each condition is significant with each other. Regarding the error, what is really nice is that you can see that the more it's getting difficult, the more the participant is selecting the masker error, while the selection of the extra news keywords remain pretty much stable. So it means that the more it's difficult for the participant, the more they select mask a keyword, maybe because they were thinking they were um, listening uh, to the right, uh, to the target uh, speech. Finally, regarding the semantic effect, we can see there is um, an impact on, the, on some condition, but when it's too challenging, so when you have uh, less than, less or pretty much one semitons of difference between the two speakers, there is no benefit from the semantic context. So what are the conclusion of this second experiment? Um, the scores depends on the distance between the two voice, like in literature. Um, the more the, the conditions are challenging, the more the participants are making error because uh, due to the mask selection. And finally, there is a semantic ad benefit, but not when the, two, when the condition are too challenging. The main hypothesis is that participant, participant might not have enough cognitive resource to use the semantic uh, cue. As I said, the main goal of this part was to compare the, the, part, the performance of our, the participant with the, this new test that we create, the long sword test, with the literature. And here uh, you can observe a graph. So here you have, there's not a lot of of studies that use the paradigm of creating a masker from the target and hence manipulate the, the, the distance between the two boys. Here you can, you have all the studies uh, on the X axis, you have the distance between the two boys, so the results are coming from the literature. And here you have the percentage. In plain, you have our results and the other line are from the literatures. What you can see is that overall we have the same answering pattern. Um, so in conclusion, our results are overly consistent with the literature in, in terms for the specialization and for the distance between the two voices. So 
So now that we compare our results with the behavioral approach, let's compare our results with the neural tracking approach. But before, um, let's have a, a briefly explanation of what is the neural tracking and what are the temporal response function, because you might need them to answer, to, to understand what's happening later. Um, as I said earlier, neural tracking studies seek to achieve the best neural representation of the speaker. This, rep this representation is evaluated by the reconstruction of the speech signal with a temporal response function, or sometimes called TRF. And before going further, this is how it's done. So here you have a um, representation of a participant listening to a, spe to a speech signal while his uh, neural data are recorded. The first step to perform a neural uh, TRF is to extract the envelope of the speech signal. Then, um, from, from this speech envelope, and what we, what we do is that we, we use a mathematical uh, regression, actually it's a linear regression, between this, uh, signal, the speech envelope and the EEG data to uh, create the temporal response function. The, yeah, sorry, we do that with delayed correlation. The temporal response function can be thought um, as an impulse response that links the acoustic envelope to the EEG signal in an electrode. In literature, uh, the, theory, the TRF can be thought as here ERP or event-related potential. Then, once we compute this uh, TRF, what we do is we try to reconstruct the signal the participant was listening at, well, the signal envelope. Here, uh, to do so, so, we use the EEG data, we convulse it with the temporal response function to obtain this reconstructed envelope. Then we evaluate the reconstruction accuracy by uh, doing a person a correlation between the original envelope and the reconstructed envelope. What is nice is that R can stand for person correlation, uh, representation of the speaker or reconstruction of the speaker. This, this is nice. Um, as I said, neural tracking studies are quite recent, and so it's difficult to, to have um, results uh, inside from the literature, but there are two main results that we can have in mind to go further. First, that the reconstruction or representation of the, the target speaker is always better than the representation of the mask speaker. Two, TRF, as I said, can be thought as ERP, and here you have um, a figure from a broad jerkin colleague who published in 2018. Uh, um, here you have the TRF of a target um, speaker in blue, in red of a mask speaker. And what you can see is that we have here a prominent negativity around the lags of 400 milliseconds. Usually in literature, the N400 is associated with the semantical treatment of the speech. So Roderick and colleague show that from the TRF, we can um, infer that there is a semantic treatment for the target speaker and in a less extent to the masker uh, stream. So this time, we ran a third experiment. The design are always the same. So we, one more time, we had the 12 blocks from the long sword test. We, 21 participants took part in this experiment. And one more time, we only use the dyotic presentation. We use also three levels of difficulty. And this time we took boys that we previously tested in behavioral approach. Which boy did we select? We selected a uh, voice uh, that we knew was difficult. So we selected the uh, distance between the two voids, the target and the mask speaker of pretty much one semitones. We know that condition participants make error mainly due to the selection of the mask keyword. We also selected two easier condition with a difference of three and a half and five semitones of difference between the two speaker. 
In those two conditions, we know that participants are making error, but they are not due to the mask selection, though we know that the, per the overall performance in the test, in the long flow test, is better for this condition compared to the three and a half semiton difference. Very quickly, here is the behavioral results of this third experiment. And those are pretty much the same than the first two experiments I presented earlier. So you have a nice voice effect. The, um, the more different the two speaker, the more distant the two speaker voice are, the easier it is for the participants. When uh, the distance, when you have a difficult condition and the distance is only of one semitones, we participants make error mainly due to the mask selection. And we have an overall uh, semantic context effect for all the data. When we compare this third experiment with the, with, when we compare statistically this result of this, the result of the third experiment with the results of the two first experiments, everything is, pretty, is the same, but there is only one difference. Um, there is no interaction between the semantic um, effect, I'm sorry, the, sem yeah, the semantic context impact and as such, there, there is, in the condition when it's, where it's difficult, the 1.14, uh, here in this third experiment, participants rely on semantic cue, but in the second experiment, this uh, participant did not. So this is the, the only difference between the result of the third experiment with the previous, um, with the two previous experiments. So. <laughs> Let's go into TRF results. Here is uh, the representation of the TRF, so the temporal response function. Uh, in gray, you have the TRF here for the challenging condition, the intermediate and the difficult condition. In red, you have the TRF for the mask curve. And here in yellow, you have the difference between the two TRF. What is striking is that first we have a N400 uh, TRF uh, for all the target, the target speaker, no matter which condition it is. We also have a hand 400 for the mask uh, speaker. So the hand 400 is this preeminent here in red. So we have N400 for the target and also for the mask speaker. But here, what we can also observe is that the difference between the hand 400 for the target and the masker is different for, the, for these two conditions. The TRF can, yes, sorry. Um, we can also see that in the challenging condition, we have a difference um, in the late component. Here, if we had to compare to the ERP, it would be a P7 or N7, which is quite rare in the literature. Um, but, so it means that we have a difference in treatment at late components. In the intermediate condition, we have a difference in at early components. The difference is here between pretty much the, the zero and 100 milliseconds after the, the, on, the, the onset. And um, sorry, in the easy condition, there is pretty much no difference between the two TRF, so between the TRF of the speaker, uh, the target speaker and the mask speaker. TRF are used to reconstruct um, the stimuli the, uh, of the speaker. So here, one more time, we have here in gray the, the reconstruction, or if you want the representation, the neural representation of the target speaker in red, the neural representation of the mask speaker. And what you can see first is that the target representation is always better than the masker representation. And um, when we compare between the condition, we can see that in the challenging condition, the target representation is not as good as the, as the representation in the too easy condition, while the representation of the, ma the neural representation of the masker is stronger in the challenging condition compared to the too easy. In conclusion, there is a smaller difference between the target and the mask reconstruction in the challenging uh, condition. And the question arises from these results, how does it work at the beginning of the trial? 
can we see, as in the literature, suggest a buildup of this neural representation of the speaker across time? So that's what we've run an extra analysis. To do so, we use a sliding window and we analyze the result with a GAM or general additive modeling. Um, here is the so here are the results. One more time, you have the same color code. So it means that in gray, you have the target representation. In red, the mask representation. In yellow, you have the difference. Um, the, the, sorry, the horizontal axis represents the time. So here, it would be the beginning of the trial. And the more you go on the right, it's uh, the more you go further in the trial. What you can see is that there is no difference uh, here in the yellow. There is no real difference between the target representation of the masker or the masker, sorry, between the target representation or the masker representation across time. While in the intermediate condition, you actually have a representation, a, a difference in, between the two representation after seven seconds, uh, more or less. It's even faster in the easy condition because this difference um, appears after only five seconds. So it means that after five seconds, the target representation of the, the sorry, the neural representation of the target is better than the masker representation. What can conclude for, from this third experiment? Uh, when we compare our results with the literature, we also observe a better reconstruction of the target speaker than the, than the representation of the masker. We also observe a semantic treatment of, uh, of both the target and the masker. And this representation, we can observe it in the, near, in the neural data, of course, through the TRF and the HEN400, but also in the behavioral, because we have a semantic context impact. And from all our results, we can have an idea of, we can hypothesize how the participant resolve the task. So let me explain. In the easy condition, participants have an optimal performance. They, they are great, they had the long sword test. And we can see from the TRF and the representation that the difference between the two representation appears very quickly. As such, it seems that the, the strategy for the participant is mainly sensory. And we also suspect the participant to use an optimization. Um, we think, well, we hypothesize that participant in this particular condition might, might treat uh, the masker uh, semantically. Let me explain. If you are in front of a three by three matrix and you have to insert. So it means that you have a chance between three words, target, masker, or, key, or extra nearest. But if you have an idea, a semantic idea of the masker story, then you can also already exclude the masker keywords. So it means that you only have two choice left. So you have an optimization in your strategy when it comes to answer to the long -term test. In the intermediate condition, uh, we see that participants are making a little bit more error, but then they are not due to the masker selection. In TRF, we can observe a difference at early and semantic uh, components. So that's why we think that here in the intermediate uh, condition, participants rely on the main sensory strategy, but they complement it with a linguistic cue. Finally, when it's challenging or difficult condition, we, think, we see that participants make a lot of error, mainly due to the mask selection. Uh, we can also observe that the reconstruction of the target is not as good as in the two other conditions. Um, there is no real buildup uh, across time. Um, and you can also observe that in the TRF, there is uh, only semantic and very late um, difference. So that's why we think that in this difficult condition, participants mainly rely on cognitive, on more cognitive strategy. And these three strategies can be observed through the behavioral and the neural data. So because the behavioral and the neural data are so coherent with each other, we want to combine them. And that's what we did in this last analysis. Um, 
So very quickly, we took the data from our last experiment, so the EG experiment, and we wanted to see if it was somehow possible to uh, enhance the representation of the speaker. To do so, we use what I'm going to call behavioral stimuli to train the TRF. But what is a behavioral stimuli? Let me give you an example. Here is a trial when, where we could imagine that the participant first entered the target, then in turn the mask keyword, and finally the extraneous keyword. Here you have a representation of the two stories. One more time in black, you have the target. In red, you have the master. So it means that at first the participant selected the target, then he selected the mask keyword, and here he selected neither of the two keywords, but the extraneous keyword. What can we infer from this answer? Well, we can infer that at the beginning of the trial, the participant was mainly listening to the target speaker. Then, because he selected the mask keyword, we can infer that participant, the participant was listening to the masker uh, stories. Finally, here we have no information about which story the participant was listening to. So that's why here we decided to fill to field it with a mixture of both the target and the masker <coughs> Uh, signal. As a result, by combining these three information, we can have a final behavioral study. As you can see here, you have the target, then you have the masker, and here you have the mixture. So this will be a behavioral stimuli based on the, the, on the participant answer. Very quickly, when we run a TRF, the TRF with the behavioral stimuli here in yellow, compared to the original target in blue here. Um, the blue blob box are similar to, to the previous experiments. We can see that we have actually an enhancement of the re representation of the speaker only in the challenging condition. In conclusion, uh, when uh, we can have a better neural representation of the speaker, but only in the challenging condition, whereas in the easy condition, we cannot obtain um, a better representation of the speaker. This might be due to the fact that there is very few error in those two, con in those two easy conditions, and so there is not a lot of room to improve. And as such, the assumption that listeners remain focused on the target speaker might be reasonable. So here is the end of my story of today. <laughs> what can we conclude from my thesis work? The first goal of my work was to document the participant performance with the long soul test. There is an overall consistency between our results and those from the behavioral and neural approaches. And in addition, there is also an overall consistency between our uh, our behavioral and neural data. Two, what are the novelties of my studies? Um, first, compared to the behavioral approach, well, the traditional behavioral approach, we use longer and more ecological stimuli. Our behavioral results indicate how the participant can benefit from semantic cue. Two, um, the main novelty of a study compared to the neural tracking approach is that we control the difficulty of the task. And by doing so, we can hypothesize how the cognitive resources are allocated in general. First, they are allocated to achieve the best neural representation of the speaker. Two, once an, an optimal representation of the speaker is achieved, and if there is remaining cognitive resource, they are dedicated to a better performance in the task. Three, um, the third novelty is that by combining neural and behavioral tracking, we can achieve a better neural representation of the speaker in challenging condition. So those are the takeaway message. This is the takeaway message. Um, finally, let's have a look on some further perspective. The first perspective applied to the clinical challenges. Over the recent year, neural tracking has received a lot of attention, notably for its promise in clinical remediation of hearing loss. In health studies, we manipulated the neural tracking in extremely challenging condition, 
which can have similarities with what impaired hearing listeners may live every day. Our results pointed out that the neural tracking was not as efficient in challenging condition as it is in easy condition, which might question the application of neural tracking to clinical mm -hmm. remediation. However, our results also pointed out the crucial role played by the semantic cue in difficult condition. This is why it might be important to incorporate measure of dysmentic information in future hearing aids technology. Finally, we could also upgrade the long sort test. Um, answering to this test rely on the participant ability to listen adequately to the target speaker on the working memory uh, capacity and also on the de decisional strategy. As such, incorporating measure of the working memory, such as the span task, will be an improvement. Also, asking the participant to rank the keywords instead of selecting only one keyword would inform us on the strategy. At last, um, I would like to thank a few special people. First, of course, uh, my two direct thesis, uh, Etienne Paris and Etienne Gaudrin. Uh, without whom nothing would have been possible. Um, thank you. I really enjoyed working with you. Um, a special thanks to Christophe Michel for his precious collaboration. Um, thank you also to the LABEC Celia who founded this PhD. Of course, thank you to all my colleagues from the CAP and the LVA team who contributed largely to give me an amazing, an amazing uh, work environment. And finally, thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope you did not switch too much. Um, so, uh, Mara Febe, we, um, the committee now has uh, taken the time to carefully discuss your defense. And uh, we all agreed that you gave a really clear talk. So the slides were beautiful. You knew how to select the right material to make um, uh, compelling and interesting story. Uh, what really transpires out of your presentation is um, probably the amazing work rate you had over your PhD. So um, you've clearly covered a lot of ground. You're clearly passionate about your topic, about how to analyze data. And uh, as a result, uh, we were all very convinced by the presentation. So it's uh, probably uh, comes from the fact that it is your own work. So that, that's very obvious. You've done all this yourself, you know your data inside out, and you, uh, and you feel passionate about it. So that was very, very convincing. Uh, another thing we'd like to stress is uh, your thesis is very multidisciplinary, uh, which is uh, impressive in itself, but uh, also um, uh, apparently it's not so common uh, for the thesis that are uh, in your Ecole Doctorale. So uh, for more point of view, it's really a very nice example of multidisciplinary work. And in each of the topics that you chose to address, uh, you've really shown uh, impressive technical mastery. And um, on a personal note, so we've, uh, I have learned that you come from social psychology, which is a great field of study, but probably which didn't prepare you formally uh, for the kind of stuff you've been doing for the last three years. So even though uh, Etienne and Etienne have stressed that you've taught them a lot, I think you've probably also learned a lot and you should be uh, congratulated for that because um, uh, you've clearly acquired a set of tools which are going to be very, very useful for you and very desirable for any uh, future researcher you're going to work with. And uh, what has also been stressed is uh, a lot of it you've achieved independently. So you've taught yourself all these techniques for a large, to a large extent at least. And that's also something which is really um, um, nice and impressive. And, and it's clearly a skill that would be very useful for a future career in, in science. Uh, about the questions, well, the uh, committee um, was um, perhaps multidisciplinary as well. So you get very different kind of questions, hopefully covering some part of what you've done, a lot of well, yeah, different things. So psycholinguistics, EG behavior. Um, and in all cases, you are able to um, uh, answer the questions. Your technical explanations were very clear. Again, showing that you've uh, you've mastered the technical aspects of your work and also that you've thought personally about it. Um, 
still, as a general uh, advice for the future, we would perhaps recommend that you, um, now that you, well, it's not official yet, but probably you'll have a PhD in a few seconds. Now you have the opportunity to, uh, to look for the bigger picture. So you can take a step back, maybe spend 10 hours instead of 12 doing Python and you know, read some stuff and, and ask yourself what you want to know, the big questions you want to solve and combine with the technical skills that you have that, that should really make for a nice combination. So based on all that, we're um, delighted to grant you the uh, title of uh, Doctor de l'Université de Lyon. Uh, au sein de l'école doctorale 162 en spécialité acoustique. And moreover, we'd like to encourage you to apply for the prix de thèse Enjeux Sociétaux de l'INSA Lyon, uh, which uh, try to distinguish the top 20% thesis at the INSA Lyon in 2020. Thank you very much.